you. Tonight we're going to talk about office politics and tequila. So yes, tonight's drink is a margarita, and I haven't tried it yet, but here we go. Um, Good time for me to put in. I'm Ethan Evans. I'm not speaking on behalf of Amazon. Usual disclaimer, blah, blah, blah. That was easy. So I was going to talk tonight a little bit about office politics. And uh, one of the reasons we did Awesome's resume first is Awesome reached out to me and volunteered. He said, hey, would you like me to put together a show for you? Could I help? Could I do some research for you? So that was super nice. And I wanted to reward him. And that's why we didn't punish his relatively good resume quite as hard as usual. We reserved that for someone else who volunteered. No, seriously, he had a good resume. But... Office politics and managing stress. Look, I hate office politics, and I thought a lot about this before coming and doing this show. Amazon does a reasonable job, there may be some Amazonians here who will disagree with me, of not having too many politics. And I decided to think about why is that? And I was taking a walk just before this with my wife and our dog, and I was thinking, like, why, where do politics spring up? Politics spring up when people have no other purpose or hope. In other words, you will see an increase in politics when people can't figure out how to get ahead by uh, legitimate um, um, get ahead by legitimate work. So most people are very willing if they can get ahead in their job, in their club, in their school, in their society, if they can get move forward through legitimate effort that they're capable of, they're fine doing it. And they don't become political. Where do people become political? It's where they don't know what else to do. And so um, uh, if you think, and this is, I'm not discussing, by the way, Uh, governmental politics here. I'm talking about office politics. Um, All right. So, um, and yes, there are streams that allow discussion of politics and that focus on that. I only occasionally make sidelong references to current American leadership. But here's the thing. What I see is if people generally feel they can improve their lot through effort and they feel like they have fair access to moving up or, or that they can see how to do it, they are less political. They scheme less. Now, is that always true, 100 percent true? No, there are some people who are wired to be political. But and somebody wanted to rant. The rant I want to get at is if you think about the most political environments, they're usually the most dead end. In other words, if you're working at a company or within government, like low level government or somewhere where there's really no hope of your life ever changing and your idea of like a great day is your smoke break is five minutes longer than the other guy or you got to take your lunch when you wanted and the other person had to wait. That's where politics comes in because people are desperate and frustrated and they can't focus on really good things happening to them. And so they end up maneuvering for small benefits. And if you have a boss, a manager, an owner, a board, whatever, that likes to use favors as a way of leading, um, then you get more of this. In other words, um, I once knew someone, he was a police prison guard. Um, so he was, he was a corrections officer. And they gave the prisoners these little bars of soap, the type you would get in an old motel room. And even though the bar of soap was like two inches long by one inch wide, as a guard, he took great pleasure in breaking the soap into several pieces in the wrapper before giving it to the prisoner. Just as a way of like, you can't even have a two inch bar of soap. You're going to get like little soap bits. That's the kind of thing 
you know, he wanted to be out like chasing bad guys in the wild. But where he was, he had to be a cop in this. He couldn't he couldn't go give out, you know, it's like his hierarchy of cops. There was real cops and there was cops who got to uh, give out speeding tickets. And there were cops assigned to guarding the prison. And he was the lowest end of the pecking order. And so he was taking it out on whoever he could. And yes, it is effed up. It's wrong. Um, or it's at least very, very sad. Sad for the prisoner, sad for him. The point is, though, when people have no hope, they go looking for little ways to get control, and it makes them more political. And if you don't believe me, just think back to junior high. Everyone is trapped in seventh grade. Everyone hates it. No one can go anywhere. Your day is regimented. You get up. The bell tells you when you can go from place to place. And so what do you get? You get politics by another name. You get clicks. You don't have managers, but you have popular people, and they form cliques and wield petty power. Well, politics in the office is really an outgrowth, at least in part, of politics in junior high. We just call them different names. So, all right. Um, so let's roll. We'll talk a little bit about this. And then, as always, I haven't talked about questions, by the way. If you want to ask me questions about this, you all know the drill. You put them in to our question extension, and I answer them. You vote on them. So let's talk about how to manage office politics. So first, um, I'll just read this in case there are people listening on podcast or later. Political proficiency is not a choice at work, but it is a necessity that can be improved at any point in your career. For each and every one of us, the sooner that happens, the better. So here's the thing. I encourage you. Work hard, follow the magic loop that we talk about on other shows, get yourself into a company where there's a lot of hope, a lot of growth, and you'll have relatively less to quote unquote, no politics. But if you can't do that, it is good to be good at politics. Doesn't mean you have to engage in them. Does mean you know how to defend yourself. Do not take a knife to a gunfight. Um, so the sooner you learn how to manage politics, the better. Let's keep going. Office politics isn't something you can sit out. In other words, if you are surrounded by them, you need to deal. It's a skill. Uh, awesome got most of this out of the Harvard Business Review. And he's here. He can post his sources if he wants because he created this presentation. He's free to share it. You're newer. What's the magic loop? Doom, we'll get back to you. Meanwhile, it has its own new emote. And you're a subscriber. Yeah, I don't think the link can be clicked. Um, I don't think it converted over, but maybe. Um, we're not going to worry about it right now. All right. Um, so office politics is a skill. Uh, according to the Harvard Business Review, most people prefer to avoid office politics. True. However, those that possess uh, the political savvy tend to move far quicker than their counterparts. I also believe this. Whereas those who do not understand the landscape tend to be left behind. So this is rules of the road. Um, we call it politics, but you can also call it company culture. What are the norms around here? I have a coach. She coaches me just like I coach you. I have a coach provided to me by Amazon, which is great. She defines culture as the way things are done around here. That is the functional definition of workplace culture. The way things are done around here. So if the way things are done is we all get together and talk about it until we agree, it's a consensus culture because that's the way we do things. If the way things are done are we ask the boss and the boss decides and then we carry out orders, it's a command and control culture. But again, it's because of the way things are done. So culture is the way things are done where you are. Um, NVA Hitch, biggest problem you have. Well, the first thing is understand the culture you're in. Understand how political it is, but understand how it works. Because there's an old saying, you can't fight City Hall. You can't fight office culture unless you're the owner or it's a very small office or your group is very isolated and you can build your own culture off in that corner. But otherwise, you're going to need to understand the culture and mostly work with it and choose your battles. So, for example, knowing how to move projects along, along, understanding when the right time to act is and whom to speak with. So office politics is a skill, but really what Awesome is saying here in these slides he made is understanding the culture is a skill. 
And if I call it office politics, everyone's on edge and says, I hate politics. If I call it the culture of a workplace, you're less on edge. It's both, but understand that um, politics matters. Understanding the culture matters. So we're now going to go through four levels of politics and how to read an office and what to do. So here we go. Um, these are definitions from the Harvard Business Review. I think what everybody's looking for, um, <laughs> great book, but decisive ruined you. We'll have to talk about that later. <laughs> uh, bring it. Yeah, well, OK, so I made you smarter and that's painful for you. That's what you're saying. I'd love to talk to you more about this NBA hitch. Bring it up at the question time. Um, wow. 16 messages deleted by moderator. We're purging the hell out of somebody. We have like five moderators here. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't think people would mess around too long. They'll end up banned into, into next year. All right. Um, and beyond. Okay. Uh, minimal politics. Great, right? Uh, what you see is what you get. They outline the rules of engagement for promotions and expectations. Clearly, this is what Amazon strives for. Um, Awesome. You can send that to any of the moderators and they'll repost the link for you. Just send it um, send it to them as a, a whisper. Um, 40 Pink Dragons is good at this. So if you don't know who else, there you go. Or Hephaestus already has it. Um, yeah, the bot is taught not to like links. For good reason. Um, moderately. So moderately political. They operate under formally sanctioned rules. Conflicts are unusual as there's a team player mentality. The environment works for people who'd rather not engage in politics, but are capable of managing living with or living with pockets of political activity. I would say this is reality at most companies, in my opinion, including some I've worked for. I do not speak for any of those companies right now. Um, then you get into highly political, um, a political arena where not understanding politics and being unwilling to engage surreptitiously surreptitiously forms uh, a price and can ex exact a price um, who you know is more likely to be important than what you know so this is where your company starts to move out of being a meritocracy and starts to move into whose butt you kiss so i don't know if our uh one of our editors racine is here um she previously she just changed jobs but she worked in pharma and it was this way other people deal with this a lot. Again, I see that more in companies where moving up is based on so few opportunities. This is important. I've talked before about how at a good company, a boss like me, whether or not I'm good, I'm at a good company, we desperately need more talent. And when you need more talent, you're not looking for who's my favorite person I can bring up. You've already brought your favorite. Even if you're political, you've already promoted them. You need somebody else. So you're looking for people who can do the job. You transition that to a stagnant, downsizing, or stable company. The only openings are going to be when somebody leaves or dies. And so they're very, very rare. And so people don't get promoted on merit. See, in a political, in a fast-growing company, Maybe you think I'm a bad boss and I promoted Fred and you were better than Fred, but I'm promoting so many people and giving out so many opportunities that you can deal. Because if you're Sarah and I promote Fred first, but I promote you six weeks later or give you new responsibilities three months later, you're like, well, that sucked, but I got my job too and it was three months. What's the big deal? Now, imagine I'm at a shitty company that's not growing. And you've been there eight years in the same role, getting 1% raises every year, but you live in the middle of Nowheresville and you don't have other skills, so you feel trapped by your mortgage and by your life. Sorry, I'm being maudlin again, I guess. And I promote Fred into the one opening that's going to happen this decade, even though you, Sarah, are more qualified, but I like Fred better. That is is a horrible feeling. And that's why I say get out of those companies if you can. If you can't, you better know who to know. And I would argue be working hard to get out of that. Be at a place like this. We'll fix your resume. We'll get you out. We got 
we got Racine out. We got other people out. Um, we get a lot of people out. Uh, Fighting Pickles, you are welcome. So if you find yourself, though, this is a tip. If you're at a company where people's ability to move up is rare and slow because the company isn't growing very much and people tend to get in roles and it's a cushy job and they stay there until they die and nobody ever gets fired, you're going to see a lot of politics. Because, see, here's the thing. If it's going to be 10 years to the next promotion, my working harder isn't going to get me there. So I'm going to try and maneuver it any other way I can. Because humans are very good at working their way through systems and they naturally become desperate uh, when they can't get what they want and they start looking for any angle. Because, see, if there's a promotion like in my team, we're moving people up all the time. People are coming, people are going, teams are growing. And so we always have the ability to step people up. So you don't have to think like, well, I didn't get promoted this quarter. I guess I'm screwed for the next five years. You're like, well, what do I do next quarter? But if you know you're going to be screwed, you can't afford to take any chance. If you're Sarah, you have to do everything possible to displace Fred. And if you're Fred, you have to do everything possible to keep your foot on Sarah's throat. And that's what creates politics, at least in part. All right, bottom thing, you get to this pathologically political. Daily interaction is fractitious. Um, nearly every goal is achieved by going around people or formal procedures. People distrust each other and for good reason. It's very stressful and cutthroat. Out of necessity, people spend a good deal of time watching their backs and far less gets done. Why do places like that come to exist? Well, one, some leaders like this. Um, they like to keep their teams divided because they're insecure themselves and they actually like to set up competition they feel, some of them think it's Darwinian, like, oh, I'm going to have a shark tank of a workplace and everybody will be motivated to work harder. The problem is um, uh, the um, people at the shark tank spend all their time eating each other, not doing work. But uh, it's a good way um, to divide and rule, right? If you don't want internal threats. And so this is the kind of thing where you're trying to keep control of a situation. Mmm, margarita. Yum. Tonight's drink. Cinco de Mayo. So I'm not an expert in these highly political environments. I bet there's plenty of experts here in chat. Um... I'm not an expert in them because normally when I've been in them, they've driven me crazy and I've left. I think I was in one environment that was this political. You couldn't trust anything that was being said. You were always worried and you did spend most of your time trying to figure out what was true or not rather than working. Um, and that company failed. That was a startup I was at that it's probably the one that's done the very worst. So... My advice in these is try to survive, try to gain the skills you need, and be planning to get out. Everyone who comes to this chat, if you choose on Twitch to come watch me talk about um, politics and all the other topics we talk about, and if Doom 1313 is here, we will get back to the Magic Loop, and we'll get back to NBA Hitch and, and um, his uh, comments on my favorite book. But if you're here, you totally have the intelligence, the opportunity, and the ability over time to get into a good job. You can get a good resume. You can build a network here. You can get the hell out of where you are. But you may have to survive it. And so surviving in a political thing is normally put your head down and stay out of trouble. Try not to offend anyone and understand the unwritten rules. Remember I said earlier, culture is how things are done around here. Well, if how things are done around here has a bunch of unwritten rules, you better figure them out. Get good at emotional intelligence and reading the rules. You don't have to agree with them. You're foolish not to understand them. All right, next slide. We only have two more, and then I'll take questions. So ways to cope. 
So I just said this, right? Read about the workplace politics and observe those who are skilled. This comment is the most important in here. You need to treat politics like any other important, if you're in a political company, like any other important area of business expertise. Now, if you're in a non-political company, we simply call this emotional intelligence, being good at interpersonal relationships. If you're in a political company, we call it being good at politics. It's just how you're using the same skill. Timing. So um, this is clever, right? Uh, if others expect you to be demure and steal your ideas at meetings, um, you can find ways to be passive aggressive in return. I mentioned that option earlier. I'd be happy to expand upon it a bit more now. You've got to learn, unfortunately, if you're in one of these companies, to play the game the way it's played there. Trying to stand above office politics, you can do it a little, but only if the company is apolitical. Um, all right, resources. Sorry. Consider who you talk to and give access to. Um, I hate, by the way, giving this advice. It's all poisonous. If you have to do this, it's really tough for me, but I am trying to help. It's poisonous because political environments are super tough. If you think about the chaotic countries around the world where people get put up against the wall and shot or hauled off and never seen again, they have hidden political systems with unwritten rules. Um, they have black markets. It's a very hard situation. All right. Um, break out dysfunctional patterns. Break out of. So if you're, for example, and this happens, by the way, to women a lot, they take on the low visibility, low value projects. Um, you may want to um, pick when to step up and take something high visibility. Um, so it is a matter of if you're in a dysfunctional company, figuring out how you personally can be an exception to the rule. It takes exceptional skill. Um, and uh, someone here, uh, Zilfex says, uh, culture for me is number one when finding a new job or company, um, which sucks because I like my current company, but I like to see what else is out there. Yes, I have stayed at Amazon for a long time because I fit well there. I found a place where my skill set is well matched to the rules. And so... Uh, it's been better for me than many other companies, so I've stayed. This final part's interesting from Harvard Business Review. Be less predictable. Don't let people predict you. Um, it's not in regard to your work ethic or work product. That'll show you in a negative light. But don't be predictable to others so that they can manage you to their own advantage. Basically, in a political place, if you're highly predictable, people will set you up to look bad for no other reason than making you look bad helps them at review time. Yeah, read The Prince. That's a good point. If you don't know, it's not on my book list. Prince is by Machiavelli. If you want the more modern version, which is fairly dark also, it's called The 48 Laws of Power. Um, and it's all about manipulation. I don't favor those books. Uh, because I believe if you're working in a good place, you can come from a good heart and lead positively. But if you do find yourself in a snake pit, um, knowing how the snakes operate is very worth it. Korean American, I hope it stays that way for you. There's a good chance sometime in your life it will change. All right. Um, and Duke of Thought, I have never read all of Machiavelli, uh, but I'm glad he speaks about how to rule and lead justly as well. I do want to read that. It's on my infinite list of books. So last thing, what is emotional intelligence? We did, we had a show on this about two weeks ago. We had a guy named Rich Hua on the show, um, and Rich did an hour long talk on emotional intelligence. I recommend you go read that or go watch that to get more detail here. But you can read Emotional Intelligence 2.0. You can read Harvard Business Review's Guide to EQ. Um, 
there's a bunch of stuff you can read. The point is emotional intelligence, if you are self-aware, this red bubble, which is small for some of you, then you can manage yourself because you know your own behaviors. And if you can manage yourself, you can then be socially aware of what's going on around you because your own behaviors aren't being used against you. And if you're socially aware, it means you can manage your relationships. And if you can manage your relationships, your friends will tell you more about yourself and raise your self-awareness. So it is a circle where you can get better at these skills, even if you're an introvert, even if it's not your biggest thing, you can learn to know yourself. There's another concept. It's hard to describe verbally. Let me see if I can find it real quick here. The Joe Hari window. Um, yeah, so we'll try this one. The Johari window talks about um, how you can have things that are known to yourself and known to others. So this is what everybody knows about you. This is your open, transparent self. Um, uh, then you have stuff that others can see about you, but you don't recognize about yourself. Those are blind spots. That's where like everybody else knows, yeah, that's true. For example, I'll give you a trivial example. When I say the name or the word cash, like cash money, like dollar bills, I put a Y in it. I don't hear it, but everybody else is like, yes, you say C-A-Y-S-H, cash. I don't try to. I try to say cash. No Y, but I can't. That's a simple example, though, of I don't hear it. Um, so it's a blind spot for me, kind of. Now it's known to me, but it's obvious to others. Um, then there's the stuff that's not known to others, but you know. So, for example, I said earlier today that in honor of um, TwitchCon, I was going to wear the TwitchCon shirt because TwitchCon was supposed to be in Amsterdam this past weekend. So I wore last year's shirt for TwitchCon Europe, which is what I have on rather than my usual blue shirt. But someone commented that they love my necklace. Well, whether they're being facetious or not, the necklace is normally on, but it's under my button down. So nobody sees it. So it's known to me, but not known to others. And then finally, you have the stuff nobody knows. Well, the key is, as you're trying to improve your um, emotional intelligence, you're trying to increase the size of the open area. You're trying, and that's called widening your window. So... The rest of what this page is starting to say here at the bottom is using the Johari window to really get to know yourself. You're trying to get better knowledge of yourself so that you're not being played by others who can see. If you have a button on your chest, everybody says, oh, that guy pushes my buttons. If your buttons are obvious, particularly to others and not you, it's really easy to get under your skin. And that can allow, in a political sense, people to make a fool of you. So with that, I'm going to go back here and we're going to see if anybody's putting in any questions. And I want to see what NVA Hitch had to say. Uh, do we have any questions? So we have lots of viewers. Oh, we do have some questions. So viewers, all these questions have bupkis for votes on them. There's 150 of you here and no question has more than two votes. So if you want me to actually answer them, go to our extension and vote on the questions you want me to talk about, and I will talk about them. Meanwhile, we had two interesting questions in chat. One was Doom 1313. We have a nice new... Um, I don't normally take questions in chat, but while we let people vote, we'll do it real quick. So we have a nice new uh, emote here. He was asking, what's the magic loop? Um, whoops, I put some rants in there. Well, maybe we'll do it as both a magic loop and a rant. So, um, what? That's really interesting. Other people are getting the emote to show up. It's not showing up for me. Boop. That's really funny. Huh. <laughs> oh, it is. All right. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> I know what's going on. Hey, you voted up the questions. Good job, everybody. It turns out if you order 150 people to do something, 10 of them do it. Um, yeah, what it is, is it, in my stream, it's not showing it. Over here, 
in the actual window it is showing up. Um, all right. So let me get to the point. For the magic loop, the magic loop is how to improve your career in five easy steps. It's what you do over and over again to improve your job. We'll run it down in honor of the fact we have the new emote. Step one, do your current job well. So talk to your boss, find out what's needed, do that job well. Step two, once you're doing your job well, go to your boss and say, how can I help you? What do you need me to do? What else can I do to help? How can I help us achieve our goals? Step three, whatever the boss says, go do it, do it well. Step four, go back to the boss, manager, owner, founder. Say, hey, I'd really like to grow my career. What could I do that would grow my career this way or that way that you want to do? Or what could I do that would help me take on more responsibility? I want to help you. I'd love to do that in a way that also grows my ability to help you more in the future. See how I worded that? It's all me helping you. I just, I want to know how to do that even better. Whatever they say, go do it and do it well. Now, repeat steps four and five until infinitely wealthy, own your own island, rule the world. It's a magic loop. Done. All right. Hitch, uh, tell me what your problem with uh, Decisive was. Meanwhile, I'll go answer this question. I am subbed to my own channel for OK, automatically. All right, uh, Mods, pin the first question. Let's go. As a new grad, should you ask about office politics in the workplace during interviews? Or are there better questions to ask? Yes, there are. That is a terrible question. But you can ask the same thing in a really great way. Tell me about your culture. What is most unusual here? What stands out? For me to succeed here, what do I most need to know about your culture? That's how I would ask it. For me to succeed, for me to thrive, for me to do great work here, what's most important for me to understand about the culture of Acme Inc. when I first show up? Second, that's a good question. Don't trust the interview, the other side of the interview, because they're not going to say, well, they might say, but they're probably not going to say, well, we're a septic hellhole run away. So you have to read between the lines. If they say, well, it's very important to spend your first several years following direction, that's a hint of what the culture is. Um, but what you can um, do instead uh, is what you can do as a different approach is um, ask network and ask someone who works at the company. Don't ask the hiring manager. Get a contact info, reach back out to a regular person in the company and ask them, hey, how do you enjoy it? What's really good or bad? Even better, network in to like if you went to college, find a fellow alum who works there. If you belong to a church, find a fellow church member. If you're a gamer, find a fellow gamer through this channel or wherever who works at the place. Find a way to talk to somebody who's not got a vested interest in whether or not you get hired there. Now, someone says, look at Glassdoor. Yes, you can do that. Glassdoor is where the angry people go, though. Understand that Glassdoor is like Reddit for job reviews. And so every job on earth has a bunch of people trashing it on Reddit. So that's fair. Just understand it's like reading all the negative reviews only. It's like going to Amazon and reading only the one-star reviews. You'll never buy anything. But yeah, Glassdoor is a great resource. So is salary.com. Um, all right, let's see if NVA told me um, about this. I want to read that and then we'll go to the next question. Hang on. Um, I see a lot of problems in other people's decisions. Make. Yeah. <laughs> oh, NVA, that's so terrible. Um, I, I recommend this book called Decisive. And NVA went and read it. And now he's having the problem. It's like that movie, Ghost or whatever. Uh, I see dead people and they don't even know they're dead. NVA has the problem that he sees bad decisions being made without following the basic advice in this great book. And he doesn't, he doesn't feel he has a way to help. Um, uh, I get conflicting answers on whether I should say I don't have enough information to make a decision or I don't know. Um, by the way, you guys did a great job voting. It was really impressive. I asked you to go vote on the questions you wanted me to answer, and boom, you did it. So that was really helpful. I will go right back to those. 
So Hitch, I think you have to get good now. This is the emotional intelligence thing. You have the right answers or you have more insight. Um, you need to get better at making suggestions and having influence. I think I can't advise you on all of that, but if you have the data, it's now you start asking questions. You don't try and tell people. That puts them on the defensive. You also don't judge them like, oh, you're stupid. Let me lead you through realizing how dumb you are. You may need to read my second favorite book, Leadership and Self-Deception, which is about influence skills. So if you go read the book, Leadership and Self-Deception, it will help you do something in a positive way on how to influence people to see that you have some concerns. You can help them make better decisions. But I feel bad for you. Look, um, I don't know, Liger Box, are you still here? Sound off if you're around, Liger. Liger and I were having this philosophical discussion. And the problem is most of the world is asleep. They're not self-aware. So Liger, I don't know if you want to send like that poem of the master or whatever and how the most people are asleep and some people are awake. But the fact is most people aren't self-aware. They're just getting through their day and they're waiting for Friday and the next margarita and the next beer and hopefully a little sex. And then they plan on dying, but not too soon. They're not really living the self-examined life. And I'm not, look, life is hard and it beats people down. You've got to help them see alternatives softly. They're not being jerks to you on purpose. They're just stressed out. They have 3.2 kids, all the credit card debt they can stand, a big mortgage, and they're not doing well. You've got to help them through that. And you can say, well, why should I have to? They suck. Well, truth is, um, okay, thank you, Liger. Truth is, um, uh, and I get feedback, I say, um, too much, but I'm thinking and drinking, um, uh, the drink is almost done. Well, the show is almost done. I've done the slides. I'm answering the questions. And I'm only halfway through the drink, Donana. Give me a break. There's still half in there. Come on. See, we're good. We're good. Half a drink. Now 40% of a drink. Um, so look, um, to... You've got to lead people through to more in, to, to see your point. You can't just club them. They are, um, think about how you feel when you've had a rotten day. Now imagine the person you're trying to influence is having that day every day. And by the way, um, University Madden, thank you for the Twitch Prime sub. Very much appreciated. Welcome to the community. Um, <clears throat> of course, since I run Twitch Prime, I love Twitch Prime subs. All right. Um, how can you tell? If there's office politics in your workplace, that is the next question. That's the one we're going to answer. And the moderators will pin it here in a second so everybody knows what we're talking about. But how can you tell? Well, first, um, this is a little bit like what they say about uh, playing poker. If you're playing poker at a table and you can't spot the mark or the chump, it's you. You're the one being fleeced of all your money. So if you can't understand for sure whether your workplace is political or not, I would be very afraid. And I would try and figure that out really soon because it probably is and you probably aren't getting it. But the easiest way to tell is do the company's stated policies and practices happen um, like their ideals do those happen or do they all seem like bullshit? So if the company says, say, we care about employees, but what you see is rampant mistreatment, rampant disrespect, not occasional, that's going to happen anywhere. But you see employees being treated as expendable. Then it's probably political because they're saying one thing and doing another. Second, if you see very strong divides between workers and managers, not just the usual, the boss is an idiot, blah, 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 but strikes, walkouts, uh, undermining. If you ever see someone doing something purposefully to screw with some, uh, someone else and not just in a fun way, then there's politics in your office place. 
basically when you see the stated values are hypocritical and the stated behaviors are hypocritical. So somebody's beating their chest and saying, we value innovation, but every innovation gets shot down as too risky. And the person who gets promoted is the one who's reliable and does only safe things. That's how you tell if there's politics. You're looking for those inconsistencies. Because in a consistent or otherwise known as transparent culture, you don't have politics. Another way to look at it is the manager accessible. Is the leader communicating to the group and able to answer questions? Or do they hem and haw and hide in their office? Do they send minions around to do their enforcing? That's going to be political. All right. Um, RHJF. Well, there are, look, every company. So you say, even after only two years in the corporate life, I don't see how there could not be politics. Humans are inherently political. Somebody relatively smart said, um, we're status-seeking monkeys. Um, and by the way, uh, that's a great quote. As status-seeking monkeys, we seek more status through any means we can. Power, money, force, and politics, intrigue. I want to take a quick sidestep and point out 40 Pink Dragons posted this thing. I want to read it out. Wakefulness is the way to life. The fool sleeps as if he were already dead, but the master is awake and he lives forever. He watches, he is clear, how happy he is. For he sees that wakefulness is life. How happy he is following the path of the awakened. With great perseverance, he meditates, seeking freedom and happiness. Okay, so this is what Liger and I talk about when we're not on stream. The point of this quote is, most people are the fools who are asleep as if they are already dead. Um, and that's sad. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not beating on the, the sleepers. They're sleeping because their lives suck. And they've gotten beaten down by life. But you have a choice whether or not to let the bad things that have happened to you. Liger can tell you where the quote is from. I think it's from the Bhagavad Gita maybe. But I, he'll, he's here. He'll say. Um, uh, in any case, um, people have gotten beaten down because life is hard. But you have to decide if you're going to overcome that. So bottom line, I've answered this question about office politics. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, it's the sayings of the Buddha, which I would have assumed. Um, Lirez, no, I'm not commenting on Tim Bray. I don't talk about Amazon here. For those of you who don't know, Tim Bray was an Amazon VP who resigned over... Um, inconsistencies in his opinion about the culture. I am not qualified to comment. I'm certainly not going to wade into that, and Amazon would not appreciate it. So I am talking about office politics. I had this show planned before his resignation, and it is not about him. I would say um, nothing about that. That's what I would say. So I leave that alone because my views here have to be independent of Amazon, but I'm happy to talk about office politics. Um, how ruthless do you need to be in the workplace to climb? Is there any truth to the idea that executives are tougher than line workers? Interesting. Um, I do not believe you need to be ruthless to climb in a good workplace. You may need to be very ruthless in a ruthless workplace. So um, you think about someone like a Joseph Stalin. You read the history of how Stalin came to power, how Hitler came to power. Um, you read, for that matter, I'm not just picking on people in foreign countries, uh, to my country. You, you look at how the different warlords, um, within the mafia here came to power. Um, you know, people like Al Capone, they killed plenty of people. It depends on the system you're in. In a professional tech workplace or banking workplace, you do not need to be ruthless because enough merit, enough ability will allow you to move up and because you can change companies. So 
if you take someone, say, working at Google, and they're struggling to move up, Amazon will probably hire them. Facebook will probably hire them. Microsoft will probably hire them. So they are not trapped. They can go somewhere else where their talents are appreciated and where they fit the culture. So you do not need to be ruthless in those ideal situations. In other situations, I still don't think you need to be ruthless, but you need, may need to be savvy. You may not need to go up over the corpses of others, but you may need to avoid becoming the corpse for someone else. And so you may need to be good at staying out of the way of being mysteriously out of town when the massacre occurs. Um, and that comes down to reading the culture well. So there are plenty of people who have slipped through different societies by knowing who to be friends with without being ruthless themselves and undermining anyone else. Mm. That is good. Thank you to my mixologists. Okay. Is there any truth to the idea that executives are tougher than line workers? Well, I certainly don't think steel executives are tougher than steel workers, right? The steel workers are big and muscular and whatever, stereotypically. Um, I do think often executives are the people who have chosen to work very hard, often sacrificing other goals. So being super transparent, I have not always been the best husband or father because I spend a lot of damn time at work. I'm trying to do better at that. Um, I am trying to do a better job. Um, <clears throat> I am trying to do a better job uh, at balancing my life. But executives have often given up a lot. So are they tougher? I don't know. Are they more unbalanced? Are they often workaholics? Yes. I can say without reservation that many of the executives I know have put a lot into work. I once talked to a peer of mine. He's now gone from Amazon, but he had gotten divorced and he went to some counseling group because he didn't want to get divorced again. And he said he was with all these older executives. He was maybe at the time 40 and he was with all these older executives. He said mostly from Microsoft. I have no idea, nor am I picking on Microsoft. But he said, they kind of looked at him pityingly and they said, oh, is this only your first divorce? Oh, oh yeah, you get good at it later. So they were basically making their way through marriages and they had all banded together like, yes, getting divorced two or three times and having families scattered all over is um, normal. Now, I know plenty of happily married executives, but I also know some who are bitterly multiply divorced and just kind of see that now as the new thing. Like I make a bunch of money. I connect with a woman or man I really like. We hang out for a few years until it's not working. Then we sue each other and move on. And that's like, that's their life. Um, that's sad. But uh, for some people, that's normal. So I don't think executives are tougher. They have made choices to invest uh, deeply. And yes, some people are happily divorced. That's right. All right. Not surprised. Um, Digit King says, I see it a lot in finance. People trapped in gilded cages and absolutely miserable. And that's no good. Um, finance, yeah, different, different. Hmm. Dr. K said this when I was on his stream. He said something very interesting. A lot of you have watched Dr. Kanagia, um, healthy gamer underscore GG. He's a great streamer. A lot of you have watched him. Um, he said, basically, people get desperate once they get rich because when they get a lot of money, they suddenly realize money isn't satisfying to them. And yet they're trapped. They have multiple expensive homes, boats, whatever. And so they have to keep doing the hard work, even though it's no longer satisfying. It is, as was said, a golden cage. All right. 
Let's move on. Next question. And this next question is the last one with a lot of votes. So I will, um, did the lighting go off? No, it's getting dark outside. I can turn it up a little. <laughs> there we go. I'm back in the limelight again. Thanks for the prompt. I appreciate it. Awesome. Um, so let's see. Uh, did you wish? So the point is, if you want me to answer more questions, go in and put them in or give them some votes. Otherwise, we'll hang out and chat about whatever you want for a little while. I'm feeling very good. Two thirds of the drink is gone. We have a third of the drink to go. I want to shout out again to Awesome for putting up the slides and helping prep this show. It was really nice of him. Uh, by the way, if any of you has a guest I should bring on or a show I should do, join our Discord and let us know in the stream suggestions channel. Meanwhile, you can tell Awesome what you want him to research for the next show. Um, it seems like he's motivated to do that as soon as he fixes his resume, um, which is pretty good. He's only got a couple fixes to do. And I'll see if I can, uh, Awesome, get your resume back to me. And I know the two people I want to send it to at work. So as soon as you're happy with it, I'll send it. Um, what did you wish you knew about office politics when you first began your career? Oh, boy. That's a face palm. Um, so going back to what I showed earlier, I don't know if I still have it up, the Jahari window. Let me see if I still have this. Yeah, so I'm going to switch over here real quick. I explained this Jahari window earlier. If you don't know what it is now and you weren't here, you can Google it. I had a lot of blind spots. So what I wish I actually knew was how bad I was at office politics and how abrasive I was. Um, because basically, I was not I was a bulldozer and I was doing what worked for me, even though it didn't work for others. So what I wish I knew about office politics, office culture, is how important it was and how much damage you could do and that. I thought if I told someone that's a dumb idea, they would argue with me and say either yes it is and agree with me or no it's not. I had no understanding, I was naive, that if I said that's a dumb idea, they would say oh thank you for your input and then go and try and get me fired. Like that possibility never really occurred to me. And I admit for many of you, um, and uh, Warren G. Martin, thank you for hosting. Um, I admit, for a lot of you, that's like, duh. But I had never run into passive aggressive. I only understood aggressive aggressive. I was aggressive. So if I thought something was a good idea, I would say, good idea, I love that, let's do it. And if I thought it was a dumb idea, I would say that classic quote supposedly said a lot by Bill Gates, I don't know. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Turns out many days I heard a new dumbest thing I've ever heard. Well. People around me didn't like that. They felt attacked because they were being attacked. They felt like, who's this young, loud kid? Let's try and get rid of him. Don't invite him to our meetings. Tell his boss he's a jerk. Like, So what I wish I knew about politics was how important they are and that there are different types of people. All the things you hear me talking about, whether it's the DISC test or Myers-Briggs, my whole show I did with Devin Nash on personality types, everything I talk about, emotional intelligence, they're all about learning that not everybody thinks the way you do. Here's another clippable moment. All of us secretly believe that we have the best way of thinking, that what goes on in our head is actually the only really good way to think and that anybody who comes to their thoughts or has different thinking than we do is somehow subtly inferior. They may be tolerably inferior. They may only be a little bit inferior. They might even be better at some skill, but that skill is not that important. We don't value it. Why do we think this way? Because we're super egocentric. We're wired to be the center of our own universe, the hero of our own movie or heroine or both. The hero of our heroine. No, that's sick. The hero of our movie. So given that, when we interact with others, we're always thinking about our own way of thinking first. And 
you've got to realize actually other people different is good. Sometimes the way they think can be super valuable and give insights our thinking will never get to. And by the way, Hot is Live, thank you very much for the tier one sub. We've had a ton of subs tonight. I really appreciate it. Welcome to the community. Um, as Parma, Paramod Kiwi says here, be polite in disagreeing with people. Well, maybe learn different styles. Learn the person that you're not going to get through to unless you're a little bit firm. Learn the person that um, you're going to uh, need to be very soft with. And if they're an introvert or something, uh, some other style, you're going to need to ask them a question, plant a seed and give them a week to think about it. Then instead of going back to them yourself, asking someone else and saying, hey, would you mind going and talking to Fred? Ask him what he's thinking about Project Poseidon. You may need to use different ways to work with different people. Because remember, they think their way of thinking is perfect just like you do. So this is fun. You guys are asking good questions tonight. I love it when it's just Q&A because I can just drink and talk. Oh, and this is a good margarita. All right. Um, next question, please, mods. We'll hit it. And uh, all right. Hot is live is wants to know what we're drinking. I'm told, though, that unbeknownst to me when I wrote this, I wrote triple sec and the mixologist decided Grand Marnier. And it is very good. Um. <laughs> margarita nights are my favorite streams. That's a good comment, Ojo. All right. Um, what is the best sneaky strategy you have seen someone use to up the ladder? <sighs> so I don't work at a lot of sneaky workplaces. Hmm. The very best sneaky strategy. I'm really thinking about this one. Uh, and if someone else, oh, that's your question. Pashi, I should have known, buddy. That's that's totally your way of thinking. Pashi, you probably have a better answer. Okay, so someone that says sleep with the VP or director. That's very true. I've worked in a workplace. I will tell a story, no names. I worked in a workplace long ago where an employee came to me and said, I'm worried because I'm concerned because I think it was a startup. I think the um, receptionist is sleeping with the chief financial officer. And I didn't know anything about it. But my friend had built the company. And he was um, the chief uh, technology officer. I was VP of engineering. So I went to the CTO and I said, so-and-so thinks that the CFO is sleeping with the receptionist and he's worried because he thinks the receptionist may be getting special treatment. And the CTO, this shows how naive I am, but I learned. The CTO said, oh really? Hmm, let me look into that. Let me get back to you. And then later that night he called me and said, so I need you to come over to my house. I have some stuff to share with you. Um, and I said, all right. So I went over to his house and he said, uh, so hey, when you told me the CFO was sleeping with the receptionist, I didn't have to investigate and I knew that was true because I was sleeping with her before he took over. But I needed time to tell my wife that it was all gonna come out now that there'd been a complaint. And so that's why I had to tell you I needed a little bit of time. And so my friend, the CTO, told me that he had been sleeping with the receptionist before the CFO and that he had gone and told the CEO, um, what are they going to do about it? Well, the CEO's first reaction was, oh, boy, how do we make sure no, we don't lose anyone valuable in this? So the CEO couldn't care who was sleeping with who or how good or bad that his only concern was how do we retain our clear our 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 key talent, and so um, yeah, this is so you want to talk about sneaky ways up the ladder? 
<laughs> receptionist must be hot. No, it was a geek company. The receptionist was the lone female. This is a long time ago when tech was even more gender skewed. It probably and yes, it was a startup. Um, and did she get a bonus? No, she left the company because she fell anyway. Um, so the CEO and like the lawyer go and confront the CFO and the receptionist who deny everything. Uh, and of course, there's no proof. So nothing happens. Right. But like. Wouldn't that be the normal concern of the CEO? No, no, Paramount Kiwi, it would not. The CEO should be worried about, is my CFO ethical? My God, the guy running the money is violating all kinds of ethical rules, and he's got his hand on the money. Now, he was a nice guy in many ways, but the last thing, uh, um, seriously, though, what is the CEO's other option? He might need to think short term. How do I manage through this? But if someone is. Look, there's this idea that's very important called an imbalance of power. OK, um, which is uh, and by the way, there's a couple of really good phrases I like about um, finding your romance in your workplace. There's a couple of good rules. One of them says don't fish off the company pier. Think it through and you'll get the point. The other one says, don't get your meat where you get your bread. Um, but either way, uh, yeah, if the CEO had said I was sleeping with her as well, I'd have been really worried. Because um, the CFO and the CTO shared certain interpersonal characteristics. The CEO was a very different person. And if it had gone that far, I would be. I'd, I'd just been like, I'm out. Um, the point is, though, in an imbalance of power, you have this real risk to the company because if the receptionist wanted to claim in a lawsuit that she felt pressured, that the only way to keep her job was through sexual favors with executives, she would have a great case for a lawsuit. So. Uh, and the reason is there's a so-called imbalance of power, because even if the CFO never said sleep with me or I'll have you fired, there's an assumption that if he's asking for sex, he has power to punish if it's not forthcoming. And so I'm not a lawyer, but this kind of stuff is completely any executive knows get out, run away. Um, this is get as far away as you can. But so Pashi wanted to know, yeah, in power dynamics, this pink dragon says, just don't. So that's, I don't know if she had a sneaky strategy, but I will say, I'll tell you another story about how sick people are. At the first company I ever, where I haven't thought about this story in a long time. At the first company I ever worked for, there was this uh, woman, again, relatively lower, but not not a receptionist. She had some like marketing job, some mid-level job. And there was a sales guy who got uh, hot for her and they started dating and he convinced her to get uh, breast implants and, and paid for them. Well, later they broke up. He tried to convince the company to dock her pay to pay him back for the breast implants he had her get and funded because he said, oh, she was going to pay him back. Needless to say, the company didn't do it. But the audacity of trying to get the company to step in and refund your breast implant money, that shows you you cannot believe the shit people will try. So whatever it is, uh, whatever it is, man, Everything has been done in a workplace. Everything. Uh, you know. Yeah, there is there is stuff. And if other people in this chat, I am sure, have worse stories than I have. But that one just blows my mind. Um, and that kind of stuff happens all the time. Um, yeah. And there's always office romance going on. 
Uh, I once had two employees come to me. Uh, sorry, I ran a big org. Um, manager number one came to me and said, employee number one says they need an immediate leave of absence. They need to take a week off. Um, and I said, okay, whatever. I, like That's weird, but if they need a week off, it's fine. Like an hour later, manager number two comes to me and says, hey, employee number two, by the way, opposite gender, immediately needs a week off. Won't say why. It's very cagey about it. Won't tell me why, but immediately needs to go home for a week. And I'm like, okay, I'm the common point. Manager one doesn't know about manager two. But as Oja says, what a coincidence. So, of course, I send manager one to manager two. I'm like, I bring them back. And I'm like, something sketchy. Go ask questions. Turns out, of course, employee one who's married has been dating and shacking up with employee two who's single. And they've had a breakup. And they can't stand to be around each other. But unfortunately, they both work in my team. So they're busy trying to run for the hills to get away from each other. And that's why they both immediately need a leave of absence. So neither of them will cop to it until they're, but yeah, this, this kind of stuff happens all the time. Why? Let's talk about why. Why do people get into sexual trouble at work? Number one, they spend all their time there. Uh, number two, people who have emotional needs will do anything to meet them. And they will rationalize whatever they need to in order to meet them. So if they are lonely and they have the ability um, uh, to uh, meet those needs in some way, they will talk themselves into believing it's right. Um, they will absolutely uh, find a way to convince themselves that they're special, what they're doing is all right, um, uh, and so <laughs> I'm going to be curious what the mods do with this comment. There's a comment being held in auto mod. <laughs> uh, so we'll just see if that pops up. Anyway, um, the stuff people will do is, um, it's remarkable. They will talk themselves in anything. They'll rationalize anything. And it's all because I've talked about this before. People in emotional pain um, will do anything to reduce that pain unless they're very tough, unless they have strong mental skills and a lot of toughness. Then they can resist the pain, recognize the pain, and deal with the pain in a more productive way. But otherwise, Hurting people will do something no matter what. Uh, and it didn't get posted, but NBA Hitch said he wasn't surprised people were getting into trouble at work because he's getting into trouble just at home in his apartment. So anyway, we've we've uh, I didn't imagine, but I should have because the margarita is mostly gone. I, I wouldn't have imagined that office politics would have gotten into stories about sex in the office, but of course it did. I will say um, I'm still friends with the CTO at that company. And he once honored me with the comment. He said, you know, Ethan, you're the only boss I've respected enough not to sleep, uh, not to have sex on your desk when you're not there. Another direct quote. So I should have known what I was getting into. Yeah, so. <laughs> awesome you will be the most popular we have record viewers for tonight uh not record but record for the show it keeps getting bigger <laughs> so yes if you can design more topics that start with a serious slide-based lecture on office politics and end up with stories about employees sleeping on my desk at work and thunderpants wants to know what i said i have no idea i I'm pretty square, honestly. I'm I'm pretty, what you see is what you get. It's why you like me here, I tell the truth. I probably looked at him like, 
because I was young. I was a young manager at the time, and I, I probably was like, uh, but I, I also, I spent a lot of time thinking about, oh my God, if any papers are ever stuck to my desk, I'm going to freak out. So that that's my honest thought was like, oh, my God, if I ever come into a sticky desk, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, you can't unsee that, right? You can't unsee that. All right. Next question. We'll do the next question. We'll get off this one. Um, a black shirt and gold chain. Yes. Very rapper. Yeah. Throw up my gang signs next. No, my mic's in the way. It's actually just a cross, which is still a good rapper thing, I guess. But, oh, yeah, I just threw up in my mouth. Oh, T-Weirdo, you, you, you're you, in sales. You have to have seen much worse than I ever have. Salespeople are legendary for the shit they do. They go on the road, somebody in every town. Like, one night stand is much too long. It's three stands in one night. Come on. So, yeah, if we get T-Weirdo talking, like, Every, every story I've told is tame. Um, salespeople are immoral. Yes. All right. How can you utilize the mistakes you make as leverage in a political company? Um, this may be a question with no answer. Uh, in a good company, you would use them transparently to say how you've learned from what you've done and like what lessons you can share. In a political company, your mistakes will be used to skewer you. So I guess I would say, how would you utilize your mistakes as leverage in a political company? Ideally, your mistake is something that can't be pinned precisely on you alone. And so you will quickly blame it on someone else. You will follow the rule, deny, 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 and do everything possible to swear it wasn't you and someone else had a part in it or it was someone else's fault. So if you've done this right in a political company, you've considered in advance of everything you do if this goes wrong or if i'm wrong who am i gonna pin it on because that's in a political company that's how you think you think who's the fall guy for this and you never take any risky action until you have someone else lined up so this is indiana jones right you say indiana jones uh in the first movie uh, uh sala is like asps very dangerous Indy, you go first, right? That's pinning it on someone else, right? He's taking one look at it being like, it's a pit full of snakes. You're up, Indy. Good luck with that shit. That's what you do in a political company. You can't, if you're playing the game well in a political company, you never get to the point of a mistake where you don't have a patsy first. So I don't recommend any of this. It's evil management. But um, that's what you would do in a political company. Ah, uh, all right. Yeah, T Weirdo is spilling the beans now. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll have her tell me some stories off, off, uh, off the record. All right, what else we got? We got a couple other questions. I think we'll enter the speed run and then we'll talk about. I'm going to stream Friday at two. I'm going to have my um, Amazon team with me. I'm going to stream. Unfortunately, you have to be a U.S. based Twitch Prime member right now. That's going to change over time with Twitch. But right now you have to be a U.S. based Twitch Prime member um, in order to be a part of a watch party. We're going to do a watch party of the movie, the climbing movie Meru. Real Jessica, I'm sorry. They're working on it. It will get better later. Yes, I agree. U.S. centric bias. True. I didn't build it, but they are working on it. So. Someday, some of the region locks will be gone. Um, I can't say when. I don't know when, but I know they're working on it. Meanwhile, I am going to do the movie Meru. Um, and so if you can join, please do. If you can't, I'm sorry. I'll be back next week for some topic not yet determined. But we now have a new topic author in Awesome. If others of you want to produce things like Awesome did, reach out to me in Discord. Join our Discord server. Uh, let's hit it, though. Let's talk about this next question. Is the ultimate knowledge for understanding office politics a trail by fire where you need to get a fa where you need to fail to get better? No, you can absolutely learn without always getting burnt. So trial by fire is what you meant, but you can um, learn by watching better political operatives above you and by reading and getting good at relating to people. 
So understand how people relate. Read the book, which is on my book list, um, Leadership and Self-Deception. So go read that and you'll get at least a sense of this. If that book is too tame for you, read this book, which is not on my book list, called Dealing with People You Can't Stand. Dealing with People You Can't Stand. It's an old book, but it will talk about a bunch of different septic personality types and do that. Um, and there's lots of books on this, right? I have not read this book that suggested how to win in a winner takes all world. So I have not read it, but I'm sure there's lots of books on that. <laughs> yeah. NVA hitch. I, I learned a lot, including about myself because everyone is someone else's person. They can't stand. And so by reading, um, dealing with people you can't stand, I learned, um, what type of person I make trouble for and how I'm troublesome. So you can definitely learn. And if you're willing to learn, get a mentor, work with someone more senior. <laughs> Matchstick man, you seem so nice. You brew cider. You put lighting in airplane restrooms, which admittedly right now is not seeming like the biggest skill, but someday soon it will be a valuable skill again. Because honestly, while there's a little bit of kink, if the airplane restroom is dark mostly i want to be able to see because feeling my way around not so good yeah i know you i know you got out of the bathroom now he does cabin lighting <laughs> but it's funnier to think of you as the lavatory guy who wants to send matchstick back to the lavatory he needs to work on the on on the crapper, on like the seven, what the seven thirty seven max. Back to the crapper. We're reassigning you. Downsizing. <laughs> oh man, we are having a rare show tonight. Thank you all for being here. This is the most fun I have had in a long time. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's really the mile height, like the mile high club. The Mile High Club should be conducted in first class, is my opinion. But whatever. Um, all right. Is the ultimate knowledge for understanding office politics? We did that one. We're done. The ultimate knowledge is study others, read books, um, learn personality types, but mostly be observant. You do not need to get burnt. Next question. What would you recommend to make a resume more objective if your work doesn't have many metrics or you don't have access to them? Estimate them. Or if you can't put numbers on them, at least explain the impact. Uh, you can still use words to describe the outcome, even if you can't prove it with numbers, which is best. And if you cannot estimate those numbers or inquire about them. Oh, boy. We never talk about this. Uh, not enough. I often talk about the book Jia Jiang. Um, Jia Jiang wrote the book um, Rejection Proof. And yes, the more I drink margarita, the slower my speech gets, the more I say, ah, uh. pink dragons warned me it was a stiff drink. I've tried to nurse it, but come on, it's not that big of a glass. I can switch to water. Um, so if you want to, people underestimate what you can get by just asking, hey, cake. Welcome to the show. Um, just by asking. If you just go to your boss and ask and say, "What? how do we measure this project? What do we know about it? How do we know the results were good? You may get an answer. Read the book, Rejection Proof. Um, it will tell you a lot. Yes, we've talked about, Dome Kang says, give me a raise, please. Well, it's true. Two stats we've talked about a lot. 70% of people have never asked for a raise. Not once. And yet, 70% of people who ask for a raise get something. They may not get what they want, but they get something. And what I mean by that, they don't get fired. That's not included in the list of they get something. They get some kind of increased compensation. Devin and I have done a whole show on negotiating comp. Check out that show. My point here, though, is go ask about the metrics. And if you can't get metrics, describe it in English. Um, NVA hitch, you were fired. Well, are you, 
you're baiting me. See, I've had a lot to drink. I was about to I was about to really rip into you about like what you did to deserve that um, just for fun. But uh, I'm sorry that happened. And I hope it led you to a better job. Um, he mentioned exactly this raise thing today. Yep. Who's he? Me? Um, sometimes, Cake, sometimes your boss will ask you why you deserve it. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they're just waiting. They're afraid to ask. So, oh, Devin. Devin mentioned the raise thing. Got it. That makes sense. Okay. Um, next. Um, I manage a client account. We're going to do the next question. I manage a client account. I'm in staffing that has some vindictive leadership that mistreats my associates. Um, I'm required to build rapport with some pompous and self-righteous individuals. Any advice? Try to long-term try to get the hell out of there. Always have a long-term plan. Always have a vision that your future can be better than it is. But meanwhile, um, try to find out why is that person pompous and self-righteous? Somewhere they have some inner insecurity or pain. If you can figure that out, you can talk to their pain, not in an I'm going to psychoanalyze and fix you, but in a I'm going to, I understand you. I'm going to talk to your needs and I will build, you can build a relationship with a toxic person within limits if you understand why they're toxic and you learn to cater or, or use their toxicity to guide them where you need. So what I would try to do here is figure out what the pompous and self-righteous person fears and get them to behave the way you need them to um, by guiding them in another direction. So this is where you do, you should go read. If you're stuck in this situation, go read. If you like old books and the classics, go read Machiavelli's The Prince, Ancient Wisdom, Old Wisdom, Renaissance Era Wisdom. If you like modern books, go read The 48 Laws of Power. Now, I beg of you, do not use The 48 Laws of Power for evil, which is mostly what the author seems to promote. But do understand how to fight evil with evil. And you don't have to read all 48. You read a few and you get the gist. Um, yes, it's a lot of books and I hate that. Actually, one of my coaches, but I don't tell you to read all these books. I tell you to read each one. Um, I tell you to read each one <laughs> uh, occasionally. And yes, your margarita, uh, you read the book if it speaks to the topic you need. But smacker doodles, I will also tell you, it's true. You can either learn everything the hard way or you can read experts who've written down wisdom so that you don't have to learn it the way I did by fucking up over and over and over again. I share honestly on this stream, I got myself let go twice. I got myself let go because I didn't have enough social skill. I didn't understand. I was abrasive. Don't do what I've done. Do better. The whole reason I do this stream is so that I'm 50. I've done very well. I'm happily married. I have a nice house. But you can do that sooner, better. Don't do it the way I did. Do better. That's why I try and teach you. You can either read the books and learn, or you can learn the hard way like I did when you're sitting around having been fired with a newly adopted kid that you have to support, wondering, huh, what the fuck am I going to do now? Because it was right after 9-11 and there were no jobs. So yes, magic loop, Ojo 4. Good, good use of our emotes. All right, next question. And it is the question everybody wanted to know. Can we make... Margarita streams, a quarterly occasion. I'll drink to that. Look, we do a drink of the stream all the time, and I try and be fun. Some drinks are stronger than others. This one's going to be good. But seriously, yes, cheers. That's our sign-off, Hot Is Live. We use that at the end. I always sign off with cheers. Um, I love having a good time with you all, and I love answering your questions. So we will definitely do another margarita stream. You know when we'll do it? Um... We'll do it uh, when we open Plus David's studio. So when Awesome Dave, who is, uh, 
he's the tier two emote. So not many people, not many of you cheap bastards spring for the tier two emote. So I will do it for you. There we go. Awesome, Dave in chat. So <clears throat> no, seriously, I appreciate, by the way, Iron and Vodka, your Twitch Prime sub. But Awesome Dave is our tier two emote. And uh, when we open his physical studio and we have a live audience, we will do margaritas. So there you go. Um, next question. This will probably, we'll speed run a few questions. We're going to go in speed run mode. Here we go. Speed runs in chat. If you got them. That's this one. See, we have all these emotes now. It's really fun. Okay, Maj, you're going to have to keep up with me. Here we go. How to deal with politics that are mostly people avoiding feedback and interaction. Um, find a way to make them feel safe. Uh, if you're the boss, you have to give them feedback anyway. Get them to listen to it. Um, but basically, if people, you ask them questions. You say, could I offer you some advice? Uh, could I talk to you about something? You take them lunch. You do it socially outside of work. Um, you invite them out socially. Basically, politics that come from people avoiding feedback and interaction is low trust. You have to build trust to where they will trust you to interact with you and give you feedback. So I don't have time to do a whole lecture on building trust. Trust is consistency over time. But it's easily built without social distancing, mind you, over food. With social distancing, that's an unsolved problem. Um, but I would say it's built by social contact, by caring about the human, by human connection. Okay, next question. Is it ever worth it to stay in a job with a toxic climate and toxic politics, even if it might be helpful to a career or resume-wise? Sure. Sometimes people stay in awful jobs if the paycheck or the payoff is big enough. You have to decide how much pain is worth the payoff. But yes, if I had a job that was going to pay me $10 million to be there through the end of the week, and during that week they wanted to cut me some with razor blades, I would seriously consider it. Razor blade cuts mostly heal. Like if it's not on my face, I don't know. I don't know how much pain I can take. For $10 million, I'll try some. So sure, it depends on the payoff. Um, yes, I try to give dramatic examples. So you can have your monkas. Uh no, it's not meant to be kinky, Dome Kang. That's sick. I can hear the moderation crew giggling, though, as they approve your crazy shit. Um, if it's worth it, why not? Look, because it will leave long-term scars. Um, yep, I, I only believe in platonic razor cuts. That's right. No, seriously, I've worked in adverse jobs for a while, if I'm getting enough out of it. Um... I've taken jobs that promised a lot of career advancement that weren't my favorite product. Now I'm at a place where I don't do that, but I definitely took some jobs that were about career growth. It's a trade-off. Um, it depends on how toxic, though. If it's going to undermine your sense of self-worth, if you can't sleep at night, if you're contemplating suicide, no. oh, smacker doodles wants to be able, in with the tier two, able to rock the awesome Dave. Very nice. Thank you for the tier two sub. Um, That's so funny. You might be, by the way, the second tier two sub in the history of the channel. Awesome Dave subscribes at tier two so he can use his own head. You might be the second one. Um, so thank you. You're, you're part of rare elevated territory. Bottom line, sure. This is a trade-off. You have to evaluate the return on investment. I wouldn't do it long term, though. Because the thing is, a toxic climate and toxic politics, ultimately, you will adapt to those for self-defense and for survival, and they will make you remember. Devin talks about this. It's a great quote. You are the sum of the five people you spend the most time around. Whoever in your life, you are the five people you are spending the most time with, those people are defining who you are. And if you're spending time in a very toxic climate with very toxic politics, you will become toxic and political. So short term, if you have a strong support network, do this. All right, I'm not speed running. Got to go back to it. Next thing. For resumes, would you omit results that may be considered sensitive, i.e. In, in cybersecurity? 
yeah, don't disclose private information. Um, so uh, don't do that. Um, <clears throat> so you don't want your resume. Uh, you have to refer to that obliquely. You can put it all on your resume, but you have to find a way not to reveal the details. You can say manage 12 cybersecurity incidents, details confidential. You can say, have a security clearance, worked on critical defense projects, cannot discuss, whatever. You know, uh, worked for the mob, um, can't discuss many of my activities, still within statute of limitations. It's totally, there are ways to phrase it that give the gist. So there we go. Next question. Um, job has me working with a lot of developers who have English as a second language. Do you have any experience in trying to deliver complex ideas on important matters? Um, uh, and if so, what is your advice to minimize miscommunication that can delay deadlines? Um, <clears throat> small words, not patronizing. Oh, 40 pink dragons upgraded. Very nice. She wants to use awesome Dave too. Um, so the job has me working with a lot of developers who have English as a second language. I've dealt with this my whole life. First, understand Unless you're miraculous, I basically have English as an only language. Yes, I can hablo a tiny bit of Espanol, and I can sprechen sie just a little bit of Deutsch. Um, but generally, be sympathetic. Second thing, though, is slow down. The hardest thing if you're trying to follow a foreign language the two hard things I always add to my list. I start with one, I end up at five. It's too bad. That's who I am. Live with it. First, slow down. When people are trying to understand you, explain slowly. Use diagrams, use illustrations, use anything you can to make it easier for them. But slow down. Second, simplify your word choice. I love the complex, wonderful, mysterious, exotic, polysyllabic uh, confabulation that is the English language. You can also say, I like that English has lots of different words. That's easier for the other person to follow. Oh, literally, literally the only saying says, pretend you're talking to salespeople. Mean, but funny. However, T Weirdo is going to ban you now um, <clears throat> or at least time you out. So um, second, simplify your language. Third, avoid idiom. Um, so I was with my ex-wife and yes, I do have one ex-wife. I have not collected more than that and don't intend to. But I was with my ex-wife in Germany once she had a head cold and in Germany the pharmacist can diagnose you and give you um, better drugs better treatment so um, the pharmacist who spoke very good English but spoke textbook English was trying to follow my ex-wife's description and my ex-wife is like, I have all this stuff in my chest going on and, and just full of idiom. I remember she said going on and was waving her hands up and down. And you could see this poor pharmacist who spoke very good English, but textbook English was like, no idea. And so I stepped in and said something. I don't remember. This was a long time ago. My wife has chest congestion. And she's wondering about something that would help her clear her breathing. And you could see the pharmacist is like, oh, I could do that. Yes, you, I can do that here. Simplify and get rid of idiom. They're not, look, um, understanding idiom is super hard because idiom doesn't make sense necessarily if you translate it literally. Um, uh, for example, we were talking earlier, people say, oh, oh I'm part of the esports scene. Well, if you translate that literally, it would come out as something like, I am part of the esports background photography. That doesn't sound good or influential. 
I am influential because I am part of the background photography. So, <laughs> a bar. Thank you for the massive cheer. Don't make me go set my minimum cheer higher than one. I built bits. It's okay. I like it. My team built bits, but I was part of that. All right, last question. Um, how long ago did you take your thumbnail picture? So, let me see. Uh, 10 years, roughly. It was for the first external speaking I did outside of Amazon. Um, so the thumbnail picture that's me in the upper left, uh, now I look more like this, honestly. Uh, so we did the rant. Uh, Danana, who was here earlier, did the rant. We did my white hair. I started grow going gray at 40. I started dyeing my hair because I realized 40 was too earlier, uh, too early to be gray and it would work against me. So I dyed my hair for 10 years or almost 10 years. And then I realized life was going good. I had done what I needed to. And I said, screw it. People can deal with the fact I'm gray. And one Christmas over Christmas break, I just stopped dyeing my hair and let it go gray. But don't ever mistake. Most of you are very young. Don't ever mistake first that you're all ageist pricks. The only reason you listen to me here is because my hair is gray. No, that's not true. You're wonderful people. But understand, people are ageist, right? They think that um, uh, you're too old to learn something new, blah, blah, blah. You're old and you're not going to work hard. Um, uh, the, the fact is we judge people by their, there you go, it's those damn boomers. <clears throat> um, we are wired to be tribal and to judge people by appearance. And so uh, gray hair connotates one thing, as Hephaestus says, um, uh, accent, race, sex, they all, um, they all connotate different things. And so you're going to be judged by your appearance. It's just a question of what appearance you want to have. So I decided after a while that um, when I was 40, I felt I was too young to look 50. Now that I'm 50, I'm okay looking 50. So I let my hair go gray. At least I have hair. See, I, I smoke on the chimney means fire in the belly. That's, that's, that's one of the many sad things we tell ourselves. <laughs> oh, sometimes get bodied. Occasionally my ex-wife comes and watches here, so I have no comment. She hasn't been around in a while, but no comment. All right, and with that, the drink is dead. We've answered all the questions. We've speed run everything. So I hope those of you who are U.S.-based Prime members come back on Friday at 2 p.m. to watch the movie Meru. I hope the rest of you jump in chat, go to stream suggestions, and give me some ideas about what you would like me to talk about next week. And I hope all of you please thank, yes, Meru is so good. You should totally come view it with us if you have the chance. It is a fun climbing movie, and I'll be talking about climbing. Meanwhile, for the rest of you, please come by, stream suggestions. Please come by and be a part of this Doom 1313. I did get back and answer Magic Loop for you. I hope it makes you rich and famous or at least content, successful, and satisfied. Um, I have. I have. Minzir, wow, your name is too long. One, two, three, four, I have discussed how coronavirus will impact the job market. Um, it's in a previous stream. Um, great, give us, give us, it's, if it's not Scottish, it's crap, right? Do I have that mostly? The accent's terrible, but it's so much fun. Scottish is one of the most fun accents to pretend to have. I can't do it for shit, but it's so much fun. So, Scottish, like, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> if it's not Scottish, it's crap. I think I have the crap right part right. The rest of it, no, not so much. But just that word alone. All right, so anyway, yes, Shrek 7. Hey, everybody, this has been fantastic fun. I'm glad you enjoyed Cinco de Mayo. Uh, <laughs> oh. I sound like a fat bastard, do I? I am no longer fat. I was fat as a young man. I am no longer fat. 
I lost all that weight. I'm down 80 pounds from when I was younger. Cinco de Drinco. All right. Very good. This has been a total scream, everybody. I've had a great time. I'm going to sign off. Go spend some time with the Fraulein. Uh, You all come back Friday if you can. Next week otherwise. I think I'm streaming Thursday is my recollection. I'm going to go look. I think I had to push it to Thursday because I have a... I have something going on on Tuesday. So, yeah, it's going to be Thursday the 14th. Um, Figure out what you want me to talk about. Let me know. And until then, I hope to see you Friday. As we always sign off, if you're a sub, cheers in chat. Otherwise, just type it out. Love you all. You've been wonderful. Please join our Discord. Join our YouTube. And otherwise, uh, if you're in Discord, give us some stream suggestions. Cheers, everybody, and have a wonderful night.